Dan Ives is back on CNBC, and as ever, he's got some pretty juicy takes on the tech, AI, and stock market. Now let's get into the tech trade with our next guest right here on set. Dan Ives from Wedbush here to tell us how to play the AI revolution, why he says we're not in a bubble. Dan, (laughs) on AI, this market has been ridiculously Mm -hmm. flighty. I'm old enough to remember when OpenAI was going to kill Google Search and when the narrative was Apple's dead money because it missed AI with Apple intelligence, and that Oracle is the fourth hyperscale. That was a recent one. you got to do your homework, not get caught up in each week's hype. So with that in mind, what are your picks? I mean, look, that's why, I mean, we spend our time in Asia and around the world, right? Because what the demand looks like. And we, you know, we talk about our top 10 picks here. You know, I think on the hyperscalers, to me, Microsoft continues to be the one that's just table pounder here relative to what I view as sort of the enterprise that's right in their backyard, everything we see in Azure. Look, 20% of the deals that we're seeing from Microsoft to Amazon to Google have been accelerated over the last few weeks, Hmm. despite what we're seeing here. Palantir to me on the use case side continues to be front and center. I think that's when I I get the valuation worries, but that is really, I think, right at the epicenter of what we're seeing. And, and it continues. This is just the start. Dan, hang tight. Dell earnings are out. The stock is initially popping a bit uh, here in overtime. Christina Parts and Nebulous has the numbers. Christina. John, Dell delivered a mixed report. Earnings came in strong at $2.59 per share, beating expectations. But revenues of $27.01 billion came in slightly light. Gross margins, though, 20.7%, beating estimates despite these higher memory prices. Many concerns about that going into earnings. The story, though, was really about the split between their two main businesses, the Infrastructure Solutions Group, that's servers, networking, storage, that it beat estimates. But the Client Solutions Group, which is PCs and laptops, fell a little bit short. Dell raised guidance across the board. They're now expecting full year revenue of 111.2 to $112.2 billion. That's well above uh, Wall Street estimates. And then the same thing for the earnings per share guidance. It also came in higher at $9.92. And lastly, for AI exposure, the CFO saying in the release that they're raising their AI shipment guidance to roughly $25 billion, up from the previous $20 billion target. And I'm also seeing just on the headlines that Dell is going to be working with IREN, which is they operate data centers in Canada. So perhaps uh, eh, there's not really a market reaction in that stock. But the two will be working together to uh, build data centers in Canada. Guys. All right. Christina, thank you. Dan, how much is Dell swung around by just how much of an allocation Michael Dell gets from Jensen Huang at NVIDIA? Because AI is so much the story of why the stock has gone up. If you you own the stock, that's what you care about. I mean, you're not focused on you're focused on the AI play relative to the read-throughs for NVIDIA. And it's, look, it speaks to what we're talking about. The second, third, fourth derivatives are just starting to play out across the AI revolution. I think those that call it a bubble, you know, it's easy to call it a bubble because you don't see in the spreadsheet. I believe this is a tech bull market. It goes on another two years. Look at Alpha as another example. New York City cab driver was bearish in Alphabet to start the year. <laughs> now, look, because the reality is AI is a talent for them. We're seeing that, you know, even with Broadcom and, you know, everything we're seeing on the chip side. I mean, yesterday, the president signed an executive order for Genesis Mission. This is the big AI project that is going to harken back to, you know, the post-World War II years of Manhattan Project here. Is there a government backstop here? Is that one more reason why you should be buying into this bull market for AI? Yeah. And look, I mean, as we spend so much time in D.C., the reality is for the first time in 30 years, U.S. is ahead of China when it comes to tech. And, and when it comes to what we see from big tech, I think there is a government backstop because the reality is, is that it's led by Godfather of AI, Jensen NVIDIA. It's led by Microsoft. It's led from what you see with OpenAI. And look, the worries about the too big to fail and some of the concerns, we are still, like we talked about, we're top of the third, maybe one out in terms of this AI game. And I think we have two more years left in this tech bull market. And it continue, that really continues to be the core here from all of our checks. I just want to go back to Alphabet as it does trade at a record high right now. And that is how much of a game changer is Gemini 3 and how quickly is the technology changing in general in terms of winners and losers? Like how to gauge that, how to think about that as an investor? Yeah, because the back was against the wall for really for a few years. Now you're seeing a major change there from Gemini. And ultimately, I think Apple, that's really going to walk down the aisle with them from a Gemini partnership. That's going to be their AI piece. And then you look what's happened on chips. You look at the sum of the parts. Look, I could argue, Alphabet, you have another 80, 100 hours 
upside relative to the AI piece that's not factored in yet into the story. Microsoft's Azure business is showing that enterprises are moving AI from pilot projects to real production systems. Microsoft's AI platform approach attracted a large majority of Fortune 500 companies as customers this year. And what Dan is highlighting here is actual adoption. Companies are starting to move AI spending from innovation budgets into operational budgets, and that is a really big deal. Innovation budgets are the first thing that gets cut when tough times approach. Operational budgets are what companies use to run their core business. You don't put something in your operational budget unless it's essential. The Azure growth numbers support what Dan Ives is saying about Microsoft being a table pounder. When enterprises pick a cloud provider for AI, they're committing to a platform that will run critical systems. They're training employees on it, they're integrating it in with their existing software, and it creates real lock-in. The shift Dan mentions about Microsoft's backyard's advantage is playing out in the data. Most large companies already use Microsoft's products for email, documents, and communication. When they need AI, going with Microsoft makes sense because everything connects together. You don't have to move data between different systems. You don't have to train employees on completely new interfaces. So it's all just easier. And what's interesting is that didn't seem to be completely obvious a year ago. There was a real concern that OpenAI and other AI startups would bypass traditional enterprise software companies. But it turns out that selling to big companies is really hard. Shock. You need relationships. You need security certifications. You need support teams. And Microsoft already has all of that infrastructure built. Dan talks about Azure deals accelerating despite market concerns. And the evidence backs that up. Companies are signing long-term cloud commitments, even though they could be more cautious given economic uncertainty. That suggests they see AI as a necessity for staying competitive, not as a nice to have feature. The challenge Microsoft still faces is proving the value clearly. Some companies are finding the return on investment obvious, Others are still figuring out exactly how AI improves their bottom line. But the fact that companies keep coming back to buy more seats suggests enough of them are seeing real benefits to justify the spending. Quick plug, we've opened early access to our new AI course and viewers of this channel are getting first entry. If all of this AI stuff feels like a lot and you want a clear, simple way to actually understand what matters, this course walks you through the major players, the core trends you need to know, and why everything happening right now is so important. For just 99 bucks, you get lifetime access, and we'll be continuing to add new modules over time. The price will be increasing this Sunday, so if you want in at the lowest it will ever be, check the link below. Back to the video. While Microsoft is winning a lot of broad enterprise relationships, Palantir is taking a different approach. Palantir's AI strategy is working because they're solving actual operational problems rather than selling generic AI capabilities. Palantir continues to close a large number of deals worth millions quarter in and quarter out. Palantir is at the forefront of building systems that solve specific operational problems in industries where mistakes are expensive. The defense contracts show this clearly. Military organizations buy software because it gives them an operational advantage. When Palantir wins Department of Defense work, it's because their systems help make better systems faster in high stakes situations. That's the kind of application where AI actually matters. Another example is healthcare. Hospitals and pharmaceutical companies deal with enormous amounts of data from different sources that don't talk to each other. Palantir's platform connects all that data and makes it usable. When doctors can find critical patient information faster, that directly improves care. When drug companies can analyze clinical trial data more efficiently, that speeds up bringing new treatments to markets. Financial services is another area where Palantir's approach works. Banks need to detect fraud in real time while staying compliant with regulations. Generic AI tools don't understand banking regulations. Palantir builds specific solutions for this industry that handle the complexity. That specialization which Palantir provides justifies higher prices because switching to a competitor means rebuilding all that industry specific functionality. And what Dan is getting at with evaluation worries is that Palantir trades at multiples that look crazy by traditional software standards. And they do. But the counter argument is that they're building something closer to an operating system for enterprise AI rather than just another software tool. And if they succeed at that, the valuation might make more sense when you look back in five to 10 years time. Palantir's bootcamp approach is also clever. Instead of long sales cycles where companies try to imagine what AI might do for them, Palantir brings them in and builds working prototypes with their actual data in just days. So for a company, seeing real results on your own data is way more convincing than watching demos with fake data or someone else's data. 
That's why they're closing deals so much faster than traditional enterprise software sales. And also there's an interesting point on the infrastructure piece too. Dan mentioned Dell and the broader infrastructure play and the scale of investment happening is generally massive. Tech companies are spending amounts on data centers that rival what countries spend on infrastructure. Hyperscalers are committing to capital expenditure at levels we've just never seen before. And that's not to mention the power infrastructure angle, which is unprecedented. Building AI data centers needs massive amounts of electricity. You need cooling systems, you need backup power. Utility companies are having to expand capacity to support all this new demand. That's multi years worth of infrastructure work that happens when there are signed contracts from credit worthy customers. So what Dan is saying is we're seeing the second, third and fourth derivatives play out. Microsoft and Palantir sell AI applications, but then Dell sells the service, power companies sell electricity, cooling equipment manufacturers sell new systems. Chip companies sell GPUs, TPUs, and ASICs. Real estate developers build data center campuses. That cascading effect through the economy is what happens when a technology shift is real and happening, providing value, and arguably not a bubble. The infrastructure is still being built. The applications are still being developed. And if we're in the third inning, that would suggest there's a lot of growth ahead. Ads are expensive and people don't trust them anymore, but they do trust YouTube. That's why three of our clients now make $100,000 a month for their business from growing a YouTube channel. If you run a business, book a call with me and I'll help you map this out.